Good evening. I hope everyone had a great Juneteenth this past weekend. Um, welcome to Roundtable, where we'll be discussing the current state of America and actions we can do to promote progress. My name is Christina Washington, and I will be your moderator for tonight. Like I said before, please mute yourself if you are not talking to eliminate background noises. Um, so this event will be featuring Deshauna Barber, Dr. Nashanti Battle, Dr. Bernadette J. Holmes, and Philomena Wankange. Army Captain Deshauna Barber is currently a top requested motivational speaker around the world. She grew up in Columbus, Georgia in an Army family. Deshauna Barber received her bachelor's degree in business management at Virginia State University. She joined the Alpha Zeta chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated at Virginia State University in spring 2009. She was commissioned as a quartermaster officer in 2011 and has been serving her country ever since. She went on to receive a master's degree in computer information systems and services from the University of Maryland University College. On June 5, 2016, Deshauna was crowned the first Miss USA to actively serve in the United States military. She is currently the president and CEO of Service Women's Action Network the nation's leading 501c3 nonprofit organization advocating on the behalf of all service women and women veter veterans. Dr. Nishan T. Battle is currently a professor in the Sociology and Criminal Justice Department at Virginia State University. She specializes in Black girlhood and justice, intellectual activism, community engagement, and critical pedagogy. Born and raised in Southern California, where she received two bachelor's degrees in Afroethnic Studies and Communications from California State University, Fullerton. Dr. Battle joined the Omicron Mu chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated in spring 1998 at California State University, Fullerton. Dr. Battle received her master's in criminal justice from North Carolina Central University and her doctorate in sociology from Howard University. Dr. Battle is a co-investigator for STOP, which is a three-year grant with the Department of Justice. STOP helps to prevent school violence and promote mental health awareness. Dr. Battle mentors and engages in ongoing community advocacy with organizations centered on promoting social and legal justice for Black girls and girls of color. in the surrounding Richmond and Petersburg, Virginia areas. Dr. Battle is the author of Black Girlhood, Punishment and Resistance, Reimaging Social, Reimaging Justice for Black Dr. Bernadette J. Holmes is currently a professor in Sociology and Criminal Justice Department at Norfolk State University. She specializes in criminal justice, criminology, gender, community development, and environmental crime and justice. Dr. Holmes her earned her bachelor's in sociology from Norfolk State University and master's and doctor degree in sociology from Ohio State University. Dr. Holmes has conducted research on complex family structures among African Americans. Her current research focuses on violence against black women. She recently completed a grant with the Department of Homeland Security on sea level rises and coastal flooding and the impact, impacts on black communities. She is a recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the Outstanding Faculty Award for the Department of Sociology at NSU, the Outstanding, Outstanding Faculty Teaching Award at Hampton University, the Dean's Award for Mentoring at Hampton University, and she is a recipient of the ONI Award from the International Black Women's Congress. She is committed to educating the next generation of activists and scholars committed to social justice and social change. Ms. Philomena Wakange is currently a board member of the Freedom Fighters of DC. She's a presidential intern under the current president, Donald Trump, and May, and in May, 
Philomena Wakange graduated from the illustrious Virginia State University with a degree in psychology. At Virginia State University, her main focus was on refugee mental, he mental health. At Virginia State, she was the president of the, Al president of the African Student Association and the Psychology Club. She has shown her passion for justice and for the people of color in America. She was recently featured on CNN and NBC News Washington, speaking on what it is like to be protesting and creating change as a black woman. She has led many protests and continues to fight for our people today. Thank you for that. Um, so now we're going to have the royal court please introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. My name is Armand Francois Pierre. I am the Mr. Alpha Zeta. I'm from Prince George, Virginia, a business management major. I'm a part of the Tri Alpha chapter of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated across spring 2019, and I'm the acting first vice president of my fraternity. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Jones, and I am Mr. 1922. I am a criminal justice psychology major from Portsmouth, Virginia. I'm a member of the New Side chapter of the Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated, Spring 20. I'm currently the president of SLOT and a member of Phi Alpha Delta Law Fraternity Incorporated. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vincent Parker. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm a member of the Virginia State football team, a member of Urban Couture Modeling. I'm a member of Beta Gamma Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and I am your Mr. Royal Blue and Gold. Thank you, y'all. Now, can I get the Alpha Zeta participants to please introduce yourselves? Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashanti Day. I'm a mechanical engineering technology major from Winchester, Virginia. I am a part of the Alpha Zeta chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, Spring 20. I'm also the Vice President of the National Society of Black Engineers. I'm a member of the Charlie Hill Fellows, and I also play volleyball at Virginia State. Good evening, everyone. My name is Naya Thompson. I'm a Senior Mathematics major from Rochester, New York. I am also a member of the Alpha Zeta Chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, Spring 20, and I'm also a member of the HCAS team on campus. Hello, everybody. My name is Joetta Lloyd. I am a Spring 19 initiate of the Alpha Zeta chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. I am currently a senior at Virginia State University studying biology with a focus in medical. I am also a member of the Pre-Medical Student Association here at Virginia State University. Hi, everybody. My name is Christina Washington. I recently graduated from Virginia State in May 20 in May 2020, and I graduated with my manufacturing engineering degree. Um, and I crossed with um, the Alpha Zeta chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated in spring 2019. And tonight I will be your moderator. Please type your questions in the comment box um, as we go along with the event. And at the end, our featured guests will answer your questions if time allows. So the first question is, what is going on? Uh, yes, that's a wonderful question. What is going on? Actually, we have one of our participants here who would actually like to speak on that today. Uh, one second, please. One second as that participant is trying to get everything together. I apologize for the inconvenience you all. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so what's going on in the community that I see nowadays is just like the, the waves of change that I've been seeing uh, in these last few weeks since uh, Floyd and um, Breonna Taylor were murdered. Uh, I just see these waves of change, in, uh, of change starting to settle down and people are starting to lose that fire that they had at the beginning of this. And I, I really just hope that doesn't uh, reign true. I hope that this passion everybody has in their hearts continues on and people continue to educate themselves and look around themselves and see all the people that they surround themselves with and the people that they 
keep supporting, putting on these platforms, and they realize just who is actually fighting the same fight for them, uh, for people with, with melanin on their skin. And I really hope that we just keep this drive and, and put it into everything we keep doing in our future and everything we invest in, and the people we associate with, and, and just think about our position in America being Black people and how that affects everything. Since we've been here doing everything since we came here and we've been put on the bottom since then. I just want people to think about that. That's all. Thank you, Amir. Thank you very much. Um, well, moving on from there today, I'll be speaking on the global pandemic, uh, the economic downfall and civil unrest in which we're facing. Um, our community's contributions have been greatly affected due to the civil unrest surrounding the untimely deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and the many more. Um, COVID-19 also plays a large factor. Um, and as we further discuss this pandemic, we'll highlight a few procedures in which you can partake in, which will help you avoid contraction. Um, a couple of things that we need to pro probably wanna uh, partake in is, you know, social distancing, keep your six feet of distance, um, limit your mask gatherings, um, wear your facial coverings if you're gonna be doing the mask gatherings, you know, uh, the protests. Um, and also we wanna make sure we practice good hygiene. We wanna keep that hand sanitizer. We wanna make sure we're mindful of what we're touching and you know, just don't, you know, just be safe. Um, but coming up next, we have Dr. Bernadette J. Holmes. Uh, she is a sociology professor at NSU. She'll be able to give us some more insight on this global pandemic that is affecting our black communities. Thank you all for your time today. Uh, Dr. Holmes, I think you're on mute. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, thank Christina Washington, newly minted graduate of Virginia State. Uh, I've known Christina since she was a little girl and I am so proud to see her development. I would also like to thank the organization for putting together this distinguished panel. And I look forward to everyone's comments to continue to learn, to discuss critical issues that are going on in our community. Clearly, we have been impacted in a disproportionate way as African-Americans and communities of color related to the COVID-19 virus. It has certainly shed light on the structural and systemic inequality that exists within our society. And we know that the African-American community has always been disproportionately impacted when anything happens from unemployment uh, to police violence, et cetera. Uh, we have been particularly vulnerable in this pandemic for a variety of reasons. Um, and there is a confluence of, of a number of structural factors. Um, one has to do uh, with the um, underlying medical comorbidities that African Americans have. And uh, that includes things such as hypertension, diabetes, suppressed immune systems, uh, as well as respiratory problems. And all of those issues are directly related to environmental factors where our communities are located. Um, it is also related to issues of a lack of access to uh, quality health care. African Americans are more likely to not be insured or underinsured. So those medical factors then weigh more heavily on us. We also have uh, the issue of economics that um, we are about 70% of those who work in first line positions in the community. Now we're calling them essential workers. What we actually know is that they are expendable workers because at 725, 
uh, you are not making a livable wage, which makes you more vulnerable um, to this pandemic. Uh, so economic inequality is tied into this. And we could go on, the housing situations in our community. Uh, many African-Americans live in multi-generational homes. It is very difficult, difficult uh, to social distance. Uh, we live in more crowded urban areas, and that is why we see the pandemic striking some of the up urban hubs in such a devastating way. So the issues are interrelated with all of the structural factors of inequality that we have historically experienced, and that makes us much more vulnerable to this pandemic that we're dealing with. Thank you so much, Dr. Holmes. That was really great and you really dropped some knowledge on us. Next, we're gonna have Vinny talk about the economic downfall in America. Um, okay. The economic downfall. Without the cr contribution of black owned businesses, the economy faces new challenges. The people begin to lose trust in large corporations that fail to speak out about racial injustice, which leads to a decline for economic re revenue, revenue. Beauty stores, clothing, clothing manufacturers, and even some fast food restaurants faces these challenges. Dr. Holmes will also talk about the economic downfall in America in more depth. Well, Thank you for posing those very specific economic issues. Again, uh, we know that the rate of poverty is much higher in black and brown communities. And that is, you know, the historical legacy of from slavery to Jim Crow segregation and the current economy. We tend to be on the periphery of the economy. Uh, we are in the bottom tier of the e economic earning, which then when there are crises, uh, poor people carry the brunt of that. Most of the resources, including the approaches to dealing with the COVID-19 virus, have focused in on bailing out corporations and large entities, and that money is not going to the people who are in the greatest need. And when you're economically marginalized, you do not have the resources for care and all of those things that go on in a pandemic. Our voices have been marginalized. And it, you know, I believe that we are in an existential moment in our society as we are experiencing uh, a pandemic and that is juxtaposed to uh, the urban rebellions uh, and uprisings that are going on that communities feel disenfranchised, they feel marginalized. And these are real grievances that American society has not addressed because of the history of slave enslavement of, of African people and the economic, uh, the economic gap in wealth that we have historically experienced. I kind of think of it this way. If I were to put you, I, I heard someone said that they were an athlete. If I were to put you on the track and gave you a 200 yard, uh, 200 meter head start, and then I asked you to start running, no one will likely to catch you, right? And it's not because you are such a phenomenal runner, is that you have been given an unfair advantage. And so white privilege is a part of the reality of the economic structure where black wealth was exploited. First, the land was taken from native and indigenous people and genocide committed against those, uh, uh, our native brothers and sisters placed on reservation, the co-optation of their, their land, and then black 
uh, labor was used to build the wealth of this country. You know, economists estimate over $300 billion of, of black free labor was a part of the foundation of the economic system in American society. So the, uh, and, and other communities are denied their privilege. Um, part of that unmantling and unpacking of the narrative of racism is to look at it from a structural and a systemic standpoint and the lack of wealth accumulation among Af amongst African Americans. It's not about I, you know, I don't like black people. I don't uh, my friends, I have Hispanic or Latino friends. I don't feel that way. This is not about an issue of feelings. Racism is about structural advantage that people have had historically over our community. And therefore, we're more likely uh, to lack wealth and capital. And that is a historical fact. And people are still reaping the benefits of our labor contributions to the society even today. Thank you so much for that. Next, we're gonna have Naya speak on civil unrest. Civil unrest occurs when a portion of the population is unhappy and therefore driven to the point of demonstrations, protests, riots, etc. The reasoning may be due to political occurrences, unfair policies, social discord, racial injustices, and more. Prominent examples in America include the riots and or protests for George Floyd, along with anti-Trump protests, riots for Rodney King, and also those for the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Depending on the severity, there may be police involvement, which often causes more unrest in citizens. Its effects include uneasiness and tension throughout the country. Next, we're gonna have Sora Deshauna Barber speak about the current civil unrest in America. Hello, everyone, and thank you again to the Opposite Chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated for having me. Um, I, I noticed in your question there was a mention of, of the current civil unrest, and it, it's contributed to the fact that people are currently unhappy. And I would have to say that the Black community, that most communities of colors have been unhappy for a very long time. I think that when it comes down to the protests, when it comes down to all the backlash that's happening on social media, is that there are other demographics of people that are finally seeing things that we've been seeing for years. And that is an undisputed murder. Oftentimes when it comes to police officers and their interactions with people of color, specifically with black people, there's always these holes in the conversations where you could say, well, but if they did not do this, this would not have happened. And I think that with the death of George Floyd, there was no argument. There was no holes within this video, within this conversation. Not only were the officers on his neck for an absolutely outrageous amount of time, there were citizens around the car that were telling them that he was dying and they were ignoring those statements. So there's literally no argument. And I think that it's, un it's definitely unfair that it takes a, uh, it takes this type of death to open the eyes of most people. But sometimes the most dramatic and um, unquestioned situation causes people to truly see and take off their blinders. So I think that what happened with George Floyd really allowed the world to take off their blinders and really be able to see that there are police officers within the force around the country that not only steps outside of their bounds to be able to uh, cause, call themselves serving and protecting, but they are murdering people intentionally and they're going without punishment. So within this conversation that's happening with George Floyd, I find it frustrating. It, it's almost a balance of, I'm glad you're here, but what took you so long? 
is kind of where I'm at in my brain when it comes to a lot of the communities uh, around the country and a lot of the influencers that are now speaking out. I'm wondering where were you when it came to Tamir Rice? Where were you when it came to Trayvon Martin? Where were you when it came to Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray? I can go on for days about uh, questions of where were you? Um, sometimes when it comes to the arguments of people that have been killed by police officers, we're wondering why does it need, why do we need a camera? Sometimes the facts that are put in place simply being the person is unarmed. Why are they shot 10 times in the back? I don't think that I need a video camera to be able to tell me that that was an unfair fight. I don't think that I need a video camera to be able to tell me that there's no way there's no way possible that a police officer could feel fear for their lives when it comes to an unarmed person that is running the opposite direction of them. So as much as I'm happy that I see that there is so much backlash, I find it very frustrating because I do think that if this level of backlash and this level of accountability was being held against our police officers, we would never have had a George Floyd and we would never have had a Breonna Taylor, but we're here. Um, Breonna Taylor is another situation when it comes to no-knock raids where it should not take someone dying for you to be able to know that you shouldn't be charging into someone's house in the middle of the night and killing them and then calling it legal. So I could go on for days about why there's civil unrest. Um, I personally am tired and I'm exhausted. Uh, I, I've experienced, uh, and I think a lot of us in the Black community have experienced a level of uh, exhaustion when it comes to seeing what happens throughout this country and I think we're all just waiting to see the light at the end of the tunnel and it just doesn't seem to be coming anytime soon because we have uh, what happened with in Atlanta someone else is killed so it's it's just one of those situations where civil unrest is something that happens within our communities often and I'm just wondering when civil unrest turns into le legislative change, uh, when it turns into actual um, intentional things being done within the police departments that allows them to be held accountable for the things that they're doing, the level of immunity that they have within their departments. It's, it's literally bulletproof. And the only way for us to really be able to see a change is to be able to see the legislative change with that's going to be taking place within our police force. So that's my response to civil arrest. Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you. The next question is how, how did we get here? Um, next we're gonna have Sora Battle explain just that. How did we get here? Yes, so um, before I get into how we got here, I as well would like to thank the Alpha Zeta chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated for inviting me and more so for hosting this much needed um, round table. As always, I'm very proud of you all. Um, so kudos to you all for um, being at the forefront for putting this on, especially during this time where you know you could just be relaxing during your summer. So um, how did we get here? Um, we look at the term systemic racism. And when you look at the term racism, it is the belief in the inherent inferiority of one race compared to another race. That race being white people, the other um, side of the spectrum being black people and other people of color. And so when you look at systemic racism, because it is the belief that Black people are, are inherently inferior, it is normalized that these institutions have racism embedded within them. And so it has become so normalized to the point where it almost becomes where we have to over intellectualize what we see on a regular basis. So what do I mean by that? Let's look at the structural inequalities that we see in schools. Let's, let's examine how certain schools 
have overcrowded um, students in the classroom, a lack of books, um, uh, ill-prepared teachers who are overworked, and then you can go to the other spectrum where we have not just white populations, but when you're looking at inequality from or through an intersectional lens, you're also looking at the socioeconomic class and the privileges that are afforded to people based upon their race, their class, and their gender. And so you have one classroom whereby 30 students may all be sharing 10 books, and then you have another area location whereby there's maybe 15 students in a classroom and they all have laptops. And they all are not only, um, not only do they have smaller classroom sizes, but they are learning not just to be workers, but they are learning to be owners. And so when you say, how did we get here? It is that relationship that has been founded within this country of the owners and the workers. And so when we are teaching many of our students, it is the thought of you work really hard so that when you graduate, you will go out into the world and you will work really hard for someone who is going to decide how many hours you work, what your rate of pay is, which will likely be exploited, which is exploitative wage labor. And if you don't like it, as Dr. Holmes said earlier, you're expendable. You can go somewhere else because somebody else is going to take that job because they need to survive. And so systemic racism is this idea that we see on a regular basis of, if you just go on any um, predominantly white institution, look at their departmental um, websites. You'll see 15 white professors, you might see one person of color. And I remember when I was applying, I remember thinking, oh, they made their quota. I don't have to, you know, too much worry about um, getting hired here. And so that is when you have racism that is built into policy. And so you have racism that is built into various institutions, schools, banks. You have Black businesses who are not able to receive loans um, in the same amount as other racial groups. You have healthcare, whereby some people are um, have the red carpet laid out for them when others, you know, are stuck in an emergency room, almost bleeding to death, hoping to see a doctor, you know, um, in a timely fashion. And so you have um, food inequities, whereby if I want to have organic food that is fresh from like farmer's market, et cetera, I have to drive about 15 to 20 minutes. But what about those who don't have a car and there is no bus route to go to those grocery stores where they can eat healthy? And so now you're building and building all of these um, issues, these systemic issues that are socially constructed and that actually can be transformed, but when you have an economic system whereby only a small percentage are owners and are greedy, and then you, you have those inequities. And so when we say, how did we get here? Ultimately, it is the base, which is the foundation, is the socioeconomic system that we live in. And then you have the foundation of the various institutions that support that um, the inequities of our current socioeconomic um, system that we have in this country. Thank you so much. That was a great um, speech about systematic racism and how it's literally ingrained in our country. Next, we the next and last question is. What can we do as college students? So how to get involved. Some of those ways that we could get involved as college students is texting, calling, emailing, donating, signing petitions, voting, 
educating yourself and protesting. In regards to texting, calling, and emailing, you can either send petitions through text or email to anyone and everyone that you know that wants to get involved with the movement. You can text a short code phone number such as 123-45 that are related to the movement and making change and causing reform. And you can also call and email your local officials for reform in regards to criminal, the criminal justice system and the police as well. With everything going on in the world today, it is important for everyone to come together and make a change. If you are not out protesting at least, or at least helping the protesters, you can still make a difference at home by signing petitions and donating. In the slides you should see, there should be different links to sign petitions for. If you can please take a screenshot of your screen so that you can go to these sites later. Black Lives Matter, defund the police. We are dying young. National action against police brutality. And for the donations I have put, Movement for Black Lives, NAACP Legal Defense Fund and Educational Fund, Black Visions Collective, Say Her Name, LGBTQ Freedom Fund. Also, you can go to the Alpha Zeta chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated page at Alpha Zeta SG Rose and click the link in their description to donate and sign petitions for the multiple people who have lost their lives over the years to senseless acts of crimes and racism. I know that some people may think that signing a petition or even donating may not do much, but please understand that the Justice for Trayvon Martin petition had more than 2.2 million people signed in support of the cause. Within a week, it had became one of the most popular petitions in website history with 877,110 signatures. Also, the Saving Rodney Reed petition says that he is innocent and attorneys from the Innocence Project say that they have evidence that exonerates him. This, the lead prosecutor in his case maintains that he is guilty. More than 2 million people signed a petition at freerodneyreed.com and a petition on change.org garnered more than 300,000 signatures. So if you haven't yet, please donate and sign these petitions and do your part to be a part of the change. Educating yourself is a simple yet empowering solution as it allows for the elimination of ignorance, prejudice, and discrimination. Here are some of the ways to do so. Checking the news, you always wanna find a source with as little bias as possible. Keep in mind, this doesn't always have to be a news channel on television, as other examples may include podcasts or radio stations. Then we have documentaries, and there are some informative examples listed here, available on Hulu, Netflix, and Amazon Prime. Social media can be a great tool for the instant sharing of artwork, statistics, quotes, links, and more. But you always wanna make sure your sources are credible because you don't wanna be responsible for posting and spreading false information. And finally, black history books teach the crucial culture and information not commonly taught in American public school systems, and they're easily available at libraries or online. Next, we are gonna have Ms. Philomena speak about the importance of voting and protesting. Hi everyone, how are you guys? Um, pretty cool to be on a panel with people that I look up to. Um, Dr. Battle, don't know if you remember me when I first transferred to state, you guys actually had a program um, that talked about womanhood and sisterhood and just um, the importance of having black women in your corner and no matter how successful and smart that you are, that um, you only get so far if you don't you know, elevate your black woman. Um, for everybody watching this, um, for those that see me on CNN, I want to let y'all know that I'm I'm a state graduate. I'm still working on getting a job. Um, you know, I'm like every other person here. Just because you're on CNN doesn't mean that every door opens for you. Um, so that's one thing I have to make clear right here. Um, if you want to reach me, message me, anything I can do for you, do it. I'm literally here to help y'all. I know what it feels like to be in your shoes, and I'm still in your shoes at the end of the day. The only difference is I have a platform, and that's about it. Um, when it comes to protesting, um, the things I really want the, to stress with my youth is this, this is not a photo op. You know, we're over here condemning Trump about it, but a lot of youth kind of miss it. They come out, and I, I understand wanting to capture it, even in the old days, you know, they were capturing things. But 
when you're more worried about capturing the moment and taking a photo than you are about actually being in the moment and being utilized wherever you can, that shows you're missing it. And I understand we live in a society where instant gratification is a huge thing and people get off on it, you know, and if you're a psych major, you know how all that goes and the neurotransmitters and all of that. But at the end of the day, we have a bigger purpose. And so for me, the thing that I would say when you talk about our generation and helping, it's discipline. We, that is our biggest difference between the older generation and our current generation, it's the discipline. They didn't have social media. They didn't have all these means of communication, but they still came together and they still did what they needed to do and they understood the sacrifices they need to make. There are people that can't even sacrifice a brunch just to boycott somebody but you want to have the same level of impact that our parents and our great grandparents have. They have the discipline, but at the same time, we have the luxury because of, although we're in a state right now where we have a lot to lose and there's a lot of freedoms that we're being deprived, we have way more than they did. So it hits us a little different. We have a little bit more room than they did. And so for me, when I talk about my young generation, everybody that's watching this, it's the discipline that you have to have. You can't just say you're boycotting something or it's canceled because it's hip on Twitter that day and everybody is doing it. You have to stay consistent. You have to ignore their stories. You have to find Black alternatives. It's literally a process and it takes a lot out of you. That's the point of it. If every single day you have to realize that you can't go to your favorite corner store because we're protesting something bigger, it's going to remind you of how deep this really is. But when you sit there and you choose comfort over the liberation of your people, it says a lot about you. It, it does say a lot about you. There's a lot of things I have to give up that I, that I would like, stores, brunches, place, so many things. But we have to, because as they were mentioning earlier, Black people, the biggest things that hold us is our financial literacy and liberation. That is one of our biggest downfalls. And of course, that's why they won't give us reparations, because look what that did for the Jews. And so at the end of the day, that's just my biggest thing. And um, when it comes to protesting, be out here with buddies. Do not come to protest by yourself. And if you do, reach out to the organization that you're coming to support, because that's the purpose. There's no reason for anybody to come out here by themselves and no one knows where you are because it's so much easier for them to make you disappear and no one ever follows up because nobody even knew you were out here to begin with. No one can account for you. It makes no sense that Towin was out here telling people that she's hungry, doesn't have food or clothes in her stomach, and nobody helped her. Everybody was too busy taking photos, and I think it's sad to say, but this death really highlighted the issue of our generation. Everybody was taking photos and videos and posting this girl, but nobody helped her. Nobody sent her to a shelter. Nobody gave her resources. Nobody told her any of these funds that we had. But everybody somehow knew her enough and got close enough to take a video of her. What sense does that make? Because it's about being in the mix. A lot of people are in this because it's trendy, because it's the mix, because it's the move to go and protest. And these are the type of conversations that we need to have as a generation because we're a little too fixated on social media. And it's time to disconnect. If you're not talking about Black lives, I'm not saying don't have a life, don't post your selfies, don't do that. But I'm saying at the end of the day, on your TL, I should see a lot more Black-based things than I should see your face. And that's for me, too, because, you know, I love a good selfie, but it's, it's discipline that's being taken out of all of us. And so that's one of the main things I would ask. And in regards to voting, I would ask and challenge people to really understand what voting is. Because everybody just says, go out and vote, register. And it's literally, that's the bare minimum of where it starts. People, don't, people need to understand which primaries are, who's in your primaries what it affects, and when you're reading about candidates, don't just go with the candidate that every black person is going for. Because look at Joe Biden right now. He thought he was gonna inherit Obama's votes because he was the first black president. And look at him, what has he done for us? But there's so many black people that are like, Joe Biden, Joe Biden, Joe Biden. He can't even articulate for us. But at the end of the day, because it's on Twitter, because it's on Facebook, because it's the black collective to vote for Joe Biden, you're gonna vote for Joe Biden and not know anything about him except that he's a Democrat. And you automatically associate Democrats with looking out for black people. Nobody's looking out for black people. Not the Democrats, not the Republicans. None of these people are looking out for us. The only way we have a voice and say in this world is their money. And that's the only reason they're listening to us right now, because they felt it in their pockets. Their bosses were calling them. The 1% was filling it with their corporations and their stock. 
So don't think that these people, these Democrats, these Republicans care about us. But at the end of the day, it's basically choosing between two lesser evils. And unfortunately enough, the Democrats are the lesser evil in this stand. So I want y'all to understand that. Research your candidates. Look at the platforms. Because of, although, don't get me wrong, I love Obama and I love what he represented. But when I ask Black people, especially my age, name one thing he did for our community that has stuck. You can't tell me. You cannot tell me anything that he's done. You cannot tell me any real thing. Obamacare was a whole people thing. It wasn't just for Black people. It wasn't centered on our people. We're not the only group of people that lack health care and are disproportionately affected. So these are the type of conversations I want y'all to have. Don't just go around wanting to vote for people. Really do the research. No, it's not fun. But at the end of the day, college wasn't either, but we still graduated. And we still did the work. And we still did what we needed to do. And I just really would like everybody to put a little bit more extra than you're used to putting in. It's going to take a lot out of you. But I promise you, if you want your kids to live better than you and you want your kids to be able to be unapologetically Black, because we say we are and none of us are. None of us really have the space to be unapologetically Black because we're reminded of that every day. But if you want the space for your kids, then it is going to mean giving up some things in this moment. You're not going to be able to see the fruits of your labor. And you need to understand that. So if you're doing that so you can revel in it, you're not going to. So get that out the way already understand whatever we're doing now, we won't see it. But at least we'll provide a space for the people after us to be able to live in a way we never could even think of or understand because the way and the oppression that we live in doesn't even allow the mental space to, to live that way. And that's really just my biggest thing with my generation and just like reaching out, reach out, use your resources. We are all here. Everybody in here is a black leader in their own right and walking in their purpose reach out, use your resources, because at the end of the day, that's all we have. When I walk in a room, I don't care if it's a meeting, I'm walking to the Black woman. I don't care if her face doesn't look inviting or not, because I already know my face don't either most of the times in the room. And that's okay. We don't have to sit here and smile and, and look a certain way in order to be invited. You go and you talk to that Black person, and you talk to them, because even if you don't know them, they are the closest person to you. Um, but yeah, that's about it. That's as much as I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And for the people in Virginia, actually tomorrow is the primary. So be looking out for that. So next, we are going to let our speakers answer a couple of questions. Um, it's looking like we're doing pretty good on time. Um, so each speaker will get up to five minutes to answer their questions. And if we have time, we'll have more time. We'll take some questions from in the chat because I see we have a couple of questions in there too. So the first question is from Kirsten Curran. What actions do you think we can take as young adults that will make the most impact in our communities? And this is for Philomena. Um, I will first tell you to begin with doing the work you want to see the federal government do in your own local level. Um, I know for us with the Freedom Fighters DC, one of our listed demands is um, taking the funds and allocating them into the community. So what we're about to work on is looking at the areas in your communities that have food deserts and seeing how you can use resources and raise those and kind of help that situation. Homelessness is a huge thing that gets ignored. Um, so it's really using resources and raising funds to help your local communities and initiatives that already exist. There's so many things, there's so many things you never know about and groups you never know about because they don't make it big and they're not mainstream, but they're doing the work that nobody ever hears about. So if you can raise money for that organization, if you can put money into their pockets, if you can do that for, um, for farms and provide fresh food for people, that, that's where it starts. Of course, it's not the hugest thing. And one misconception about change is people, if, if they don't see it happening right there, they get discouraged or don't feel like it's really being impacted. But that's not the case. And whenever you're doing change, like I said before, you just have to accept that the fruits of your labor, you may not even see come into fruition. But you have to know and follow, you know, the groundworks and the blueprints that other people have put there. So my biggest thing is put money into your communities, your rec centers your food deserts and putting actual fresh food and making it accessible to people. Talking to your legislators and asking, why is it that a white neighborhood has a bit, bunch of grocery stores, but my, my cousin's neighborhood only has one, if that. 
that's purposeful things. Those are literally systemic things done to black people and understanding systemic racism and how you can tackle it just beyond legislating. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Sora Deshana Barber. Um, question is, where can we approve the most as a collective? Um, I think there's a few things and a lot of it, it seems like Philomena has already kind of tapped on in terms of what we can do as a collective community. Um, so I'm not gonna double back on anything that she says. I'm gonna add to what she's saying because a lot of it carries over to this question. Um, what I think we can do as a collective, especially as a community, is we should be able to take our dollars and our cents a little bit more seriously. I don't think we understand the power of our wallets and I don't think that even for someone that would consider themselves to, to be lower class, not like a, a middle class financial situation, even, even the most impoverished family still has a level of money that they are contributing to these big, large scale Fortune 500 companies that are using their dollars to pay into political, political faces and political parties that are doing everything they can for uh, the, the, the demise of our community. So we have to take our dollars very seriously. And I posted this on my social media, I think sometime last week, where I posted all the people, all the organizations that I'm no longer supporting. Um, as much as the Black Square was great, I loved seeing the Black Square on some of these large scale organizations, uh, Instagram pages. My focus is on whose campaigns are you contributing to? I'm curious. And um, when I did some looking through and some researching, I found some of the, some of my favorite food places are, are large scale contributors to uh, campaigns and political figures that are focused on d tearing apart the black community. So I think that as much as we wanna eat well, uh, we should start looking into shifting some of our dollars, all of our dollars into black owned businesses and making sure that, okay, I don't want to buy a burger from this organization or from this, this company because they contributed to this campaign. So let me see if I can find a black owned business or a small mom and pop shop where I can buy a burger today. We have to be very intentional with where we put our money. And I don't think that we're intentional. I actually think we're pretty frivolous with our money. Um, I know that I'm a big brand person, not as much as I should be, but I'm a big brand person. I've had to take a step back over the past two years um, from diving into some of these large brands. I pulled back from H&M after that monkey t-shirt that they made. Um, I pulled back from uh, Chanel. I pulled back from Gucci. I pulled back from all these large trendy brands that a lot of our community throws dollars into without realizing that they're loving our money, but they're not loving our fight. They're not loving our movement. They're not interested in um, doing anything that they can to prevent the demise of our communities. So we have to be a little bit more uh, focused on where it is that we're putting our money. I'm no longer eating at Chick-fil-A and I love their waffle fries and their Chick-fil-A sauce, but I'm not going there. Um, I was very disappointed at Starbucks, uh, but I know that they allowed the person to wear Black Lives Matter, but they told them to take it off and say, put it back on. No longer getting a white chocolate mocha from there anymore. Um, I understand they went back, everyone's like, no, they, they changed their mind. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It was too late. So we, we have to really think about the subliminals. And I think that that's what happens a lot when it comes to these brands and these, uh, these organizations. They play stupid real good. Like, I didn't know that. I didn't know. I didn't know. Or, oh, it's just this franchise level that's being racist. It's not a representation of the entire organization. Listen, you are responsible for every employee down to the person that makes the coffee, to the person that's at the executive level. If they're racist, when they put coffee into my cup, your entire organization is racist in my eyes. Therefore, I'm never purchasing from you again. And that's just how I see things. And I think that that's how we should see things as a community when it comes to our purchasing power. Not only that, the black community, we set trends. TikTok is what it is because of the black community. Because of the dances and little movements that we're doing, we have made TikTok cool. And the black community has a tendency to make these apps cool, to make these brands cool, to make these outfits cool, these trends, these styles. That's all on us. 
So we have to make sure that we're thinking heavily into what we are allowing our time and our effort and our money, uh, what we're allowing it to do on the back end. And what we're doing is we're making a lot of people rich. And the question is, do they deserve that? Do they deserve what we're giving them? So as a collective, I think at the most minuscule level, if we take the time out to say, you know what, do I need to buy my earring from here? Do I need to walk into Target? Do I need to walk into Walmart? Do I need to walk into Chick-fil-A? Do I need to walk into McDonald's? We need to think about every step we take for the rest of our lives. Every single cent, I plan to verify that this organization, this corporation, this company is actually in it for, um, actually cares about me down to the smallest level that cares about my race, cares about my gender, uh, cares about my philanthropies and the things that I care about. If they're not willing to say Black Lives Matter, then I'm definitely not walking in there. So we need to be a little bit more, uh, less frivolous about where our money is going. We need to be intentional and we need to take our dollars very seriously. It doesn't matter if it's $1, $2 or 100. We need to take our money very seriously and stop making people rich that don't care about us. That is definitely a great point. Um, the next question is for Dr. Holmes. What changes would you want to see in the coming years and how do we get there? Well, that's, uh, can you hear me? Um, that's a, well, change is an ongoing process, and I'm reminded of the saying, be the change that you want to see in the world, and power concedes nothing without demand. So we're constantly going to have to uh, speak truth to power, and we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. You are the manifestation of the hopes and dreams of our ancestors. And um, while there may be differences in strategy across generations and so forth, the, and you know, some have degrees and some don't and all of those different things, but the bottom line is we are black people and our lives are under assault. And that is because those who are in power see the demographics shifting. We are, um, global citizens, and we are not minorities in the world. There are more people of color, and I think we have to think more globally and act locally. Um, I concur with all of the strategies that um, you have, as young people have mentioned, that we must be mindful, intentional, um, and conscious of our role in the struggle for liberation of our, of our people. Um, as an academic, for example, one of the things that I tell my students, someone is sacrificing for you to be here. And so you need to come to class. You're not helping anyone by not doing what you need to do. We each are at a different um, phase in our lives where we have to use our gifts, whatever they are. Um, Dr. Battle and I are educators, so we use our gifts in the classroom and through our research and knowledge. Uh, someone else may be in the courtroom battling. You have some who are health in the healthcare uh, arena uh, advocating and working for better access to healthcare for our community. Uh, we have a section of our community uh, who are working towards economic empowerment and entrepreneurship within our own community and letting those dollars stay in our community. Those are all critical things, but you know, um, we are fighting, and someone said, for those who are yet born, you know, and we don't realize all of our dreams in our lifetime. Um, 
they, the sacrifices that we're making are for the next generation and their children and their children and their children. And along the way, that's a part of our human self that we get tired. Black people are experiencing collective trauma. I mean, to, to watch what is going on between the COVID virus and the impact on our, the disproportionate impact on our community, being fearful about going to work, um, how do you keep a roof over your head, um, how, are our, how are HBCUs going to weather this? How, we, how will we um, move forward in the future as a critical part in the education of our communities? These are things that we have to, to work towards and to ensure our viability as HBCUs. I am a, a strong, obviously, a proponent of HBCUs. I am a product of an HBCU. I sent my daughter to an HBCU. Shout out to her. Um, now, at the, lex at the next level, she is going to a PWI for her graduate education. But I, and, and she, you know, had other options at the undergraduate level, but I felt it was important for her and her development as a young person to be under the tutelage of people who looked like her, people who could pour into her uh, academically, uh, spiritually, politically, like a Dr. Battle, who has poured into many of you on her campus. So we each have a role to play, and we have to be mindful of what our responsibility is in terms of the struggle and um, our humanity towards each other, because we've been co-opted and hoodwinked into thinking that other folks' stuff is always better than our own. But all, all liberation, the, the starting point in liberation is self-love and liberation of the mind. My, you know, my, my body may be in shackles, but my mind is free. And so uh, I may not have the economic um, resources that someone else has, but I bring another gift to the table. And when we put all of these pieces together, just like we see the screen before us, then we have the strength in numbers to effectuate change in this society. You've made some amazing points. Um, going to our next question, Dr. Battle, what kind of policies need to be put together in order to take us to that place of complete freedom? Um, I would look at well, first policies, educational policies, but what type of education are we actually offering our students? Um, and so we need to reimagine how the structural, various structural systems can actually um, illuminate within communities and to have a more equal level playing field in all of these various institutions. And so um, educational policies need to be um, addressed. We need smaller classroom sizes. We need um, effective teaching that actually um, moves away from individualism and promotes collectivity. And so many students who have had me um, in my classes, they know typically they're always going to be in groups. They're going to be working together, problem solving, um, identifying their roles and what they're best at, and that is intentional. They often tell me, oh, we feel like we're just, you know, having a whole bunch of fun. And, you know, I don't want them to be bored. But at the same time, I'm very intentional with my pedagogical strategy to have them working together um, because it's a divisiveness amongst 
sometimes our often um, our own community, which does not allow for policies that we actually need to be created because we have the back and forth um, amongst ourselves at times. And so we need educational policies because that, like Malcolm X said, is the pathway to our future. Um, from a criminal justice standpoint, you know, we talk about training and diversity training um, on a regular basis. And I have had several conversations with police officers who will say, you know, we go, we listen to what the speaker has to say just to check off a box, and then we leave. And so we need to think about um, reallocating resources, economic resources, into communities who are marginalized. And so um, we also need to possibly think about people um, within communities policing their own communities. And we also need to think about collaborative policies whereby you may have social workers or other trained mental health professionals working with police officers in certain um, cases where they're called in because if they, if the argument is that they're scared every single time, maybe they should have, you know, other trained workers who may know how to diffuse a situation um, in a more appropriate way than what we've unfortunately seen. So just, you know, equality amongst our various structural institutions is where we can start. Thank you so much for that. Um, actually, Philomena, she has to go. I don't know if she's still in here, but she was on call for Freedom Fighters DC. Oh, she's here, so she can tell you. <laughs> Yeah, guys, sorry, I have to go. Um, they're tear gassing people at the White House, and I have a lot of people out there. So I kind of just got to go deal with that situation. Um, but I just wanted to thank you guys for having me, and I'm so honored to speak to such amazing and dope women. Um, y'all are amazing. People I looked up to never thought I would be talking to y'all on a panel, at least at this age. Um, but thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be safe, so don't worry. We're good. We have legal advisors. We have a bail fund, so we're perfectly fine. Um, we j we know what we signed up for. You know, It's not always going to be peaceful, but we do try to strive for peace because sometimes peace doesn't get it done. Um, so thank you, guys. I just don't want to leave abruptly and just let you guys know I was leaving. Thank you so much, and please be safe, and thank you for coming. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> so the next question is for Dr. Holmes. If we only give our money to black owned businesses, what do you think will happen to our economy? And this is from Ayanna Lassiter. Well, you know, it brings about change. The economy is not working for us. Let's be very clear on that. The, uh, the majority of our community, uh, we, we have accumulated income. We have not accumulated wealth and income is variable. So if I get, if I lose my job, if my hours get cut, I don't have any assets to fall upon. So we have to start thinking about building generational wealth. That's number one. And the economy, you know, what's going to happen to the economy? Um, the, the, the bigger question is, our economic support of institutions is critical to bringing about change. You know, when you look at the Montgomery bus boycott, they didn't just let Black people sit at the front of the bus because there was an epiphany of good feelings and they had some moral awakening. It was economic pressure on the system because Black folks were the riders on the bus primarily. And for a whole year, Black folks didn't uh, ride the buses. So it was the economic pressure that was brought to bear. And, and we do, we spend a lot of money in the Black community and your um, colleague pointed that out. It's how we use those dollars. But yes, I think we should do everything that we can to support Black businesses, okay? To support Black institutions, not just businesses, 
uh, our the HBCUs. You know, everyone was so eager to to go off to um, predominantly white institutions, and um, they can't sit in the lobby without the police being called on them because you really don't belong there. So uh, we have to think about our role in supporting our own institutions. The Black church was a major vehicle for mobilization of Black people. It also provided resources and a social network to deal with community crises, to deal with uh, people who didn't have a safety net because we were excluded from those public resources that were available to the white community. So we were used to taking uh, care within our own community. And we, we moved away from that tradition to a, to a tradition of prosperity ministry. How can I get the biggest hat and how can I get the, the biggest edifice um, and, and, and be on uh, TBN? That became the mission of the black church rather than the kind of outreach that was needed and that is needed in our community to deal with those issues. And I wanna make one point about the, the defunding of the police because that is being misinterpreted and all of that kind of stuff. And that's a fear tactic. And um, on, was it Saturday night when uh, the person in the White House said, at his rally that the amigos will be breaking into your house and you won't be able to call the police okay he was sending a very racialized message to his base uh in terms of white supremacy that is casting brown people as criminal when when people are talking about defunding the people police, they're talking about reimagining, as Dr. Battle said, ways of doing policing. Um, you know, them not coming to a call for a mental health crisis. That should be a mental health team that is deployed for that person. Um, and those are, those are things that, you know, basic policy changes that can occur but the bottom line is, it is not an issue of a rotten apple, that this is just a bad officer over here. The, the history of policing is rooted in racism and monitoring and controlling black bodies. So we have to, we have to change that system as with other systems within our society. But let me tell you, they, they, they're not going to let the system crumble because they want to maintain their wealth. And just like they found $2 trillion, they can find another $2 trillion. I've been broke before, but I've never been dead. So I can, I, I can make it, you know, but we, we have to start thinking like that in terms of our protection of ourselves and uh, our families because they, no one else is going to do that but us. We're, uh, we are expendable in the minds of white folks. You know, that is a fundamental basis of white supremacy is our dehumanization as people. We, we are there to provide service for them. And they don't care if we get the COVID virus, but bring me, you know, my meal at my restaurant. And why are you complaining? Get in here, um, get back on that plow. That that's what they that's what they want. And so we have to be uh, mindful and strategic, and we always have to be strategized. I've heard a lot of young people say, oh, well, I'm not impressed with Biden, but if you stay home, what's going to happen? We will have another four years of Donald Trump. Politics isn't always about, you know, the perfect candidate. 
It is about developing coalitions and, and leveraging your power to get what you, what you want. And we, we have to be strategic in that. In every election uh, down the ballot, because those local elections impact how uh, funding for police, funding for education and all of those kinds of things. And I would encourage all of you to go into the next generation of leaders in our communities across the board. You are powerful in your thinking about the community. You are well trained uh, under the tutelage of people who have helped you to develop a level of consciousness because it doesn't mean anything just to put a black face out front. If that black face is not advocating and committed to our community, that's a, that's a different agenda. And so I would encourage, and, and I'm hopeful when I see the, the, the young people out there marching and, and organizing in different ways, and this is one of those. And um, that's why we started our remarks to say that we're proud of you and what you're doing in your generation. We're passing the baton. Uh, to your generation, you are the leaders in our community. Thank you for that. Um, that was really powerful. So our next question is for Soror Barber. How do you feel about people saying that this sudden pink peak or interest in the Black Lives Matter movement is only temporary and people are only supporting it because it's a quote unquote trend. And this is from Egypt Downs. Um, that's a good question. I wanna tap on the first half before I tap on the back half. So the how do I feel about people saying that this sudden peak slash interest in the Black Lives Matter movement is only temporary. Um, in, in, in regards to that portion of the question, I don't want us to minimize the power of a trend. Um, it's sometimes it takes something going viral for a conversation to be started and then a conversation then in turn creates change. So I don't want to minimize the power of a trend. Um, I want us to recognize that sometimes it takes some of these clout chasers uh, to be able to allow us to have some of our causes put on the forefront of the conversation. And sometimes it takes that. Uh, it's not a great part of it, but it, it takes that. Now, when it comes to people only supporting it because it's a trend, um, again, sometimes we need the clout chasers. And I, I talked about this actually last week, um, again, on my social media platform, because I consider myself to be an influencer. And I'm surrounded by a lot of influencers who I believe are only here because it's a trend and are only here because it's cool. And, you know, I put within my Instagram story that it's important for us influencers. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for, for jumping on this bandwagon. But just know that once you walk in this door, you can't walk out. Once you state Black Lives Matter and that's hosted on your social media accounts, that's something that you truly believe. This is not something, this is not just a wave of emotion. It is not uh, looking at our lives and our fight as a, uh, a temporary feeling. This is something that we have to embrace each day. This is something we experience each day. And my life is never going to be a trend. My life is my life. And it is a, a powerful, rooted tree within the earth of this country. So I'm not interested in people choosing to, to treat Black Lives Matter as if it is a trend, because it truly is a living and being thing. The best thing that we can do is hold people accountable uh, continue to hold people accountable, but do understand that trends do hold power and that as we continue to make certain things go viral, there might be another moment where we allow something to go viral. Um, I wanted to make sure that I said this while I had time. There's this Instagram page that I, that I follow. It's called Pull Up for Change. Um, probably can't see it. Let's see. Pull Up for Change. So anywho, this organization is a really cool organization they, they have in their Instagram story, fighting for economic opportunities for black people. I think that regardless of everything that we say when it comes to everything that's based in systematic oppression, if we had money, if we had wealth, it would 
fix 99% of our problems, um, or maybe 90% because we still have them. Anyway, it will fix a good portion of our problems if we had uh, wealth and generational wealth. So this organization is telling people to pull up for change, which is basically opening up their workforce and telling us how much of their executive level and how much of their board are people of color, but how much of their board is black. Um, I think that black people having the opportunity to have a seat at the table changes the world. We have to first get to the table first. So holding a lot of these Fortune 500 companies accountable for not making this a trend, not posting the black square and saying black lives matter, but are you promoting black people? Are you giving black people a voice within your organization, within your companies? Um, that's really important. So go to pull up for change on your Instagram, follow them. And you can see them posting uh, Facebook, Uber, Old Navy, Cosmopolitan, Essence, Gap, Apple, all these places where you can see how many of their organization is executive level. Um, is, is a part of their board. And if none of them are black, I've already decided I'm not, I'm not supporting any organization that doesn't have any black person at their executive level, period. Um, and then just to say a little bit about what Dr. Holmes was saying, and then I think it was a little tap of what Dr. Battle was saying, when, when it comes to being able to make change, it is having a seat at the table. A lot of the decisions that are being made by attorney generals, a lot of the decisions that are being made uh, by, by Supreme Court justices and all these things, they're, they're being made by people that don't look like us, therefore they don't really care about our cause and they don't understand our experience. So I would say to strive for bigger and strive for better as a community, as young people, any of you can be lawyers, judges, attorney generals, any of you can be the next president of the United States in 10, 20 years if you wanted to. Any of you can sit at uh, Congress and, and, and be a senator and be a governor. Those are the things that you should be striving to be. You should be striving to have a seat at a table, at an impactful table. At some point, five, 10 years from now, I hope to be running for some type of office. That's my plan. Um, but the only reason why I'm doing that is because I'm realizing the power of some of these people that we're voting into office and they are making decisions that impact the lives of our, of us, our children and our children's children. So we have to keep that in mind. Not only do we not need to be purchasing from some of these Fortune 500 companies that don't care about our causes, we should be looking at what can I do to have a seat at a table? That should be our focus. What can you do to elevate yourself to be able to have a voice that impacts the community that we care about and the community that we live in? Um, so yeah, I probably didn't tap too much on the trend thing, but I hope you guys got it, but that's my answer. Okay, um, we are running short of time. Just to be mindful, we will have to cut down on the open discussion more than how we anticipated. But the last question that we do have goes to uh, Dr. Battle. Why is it so hard to, for our people as a collective to let go of the superiority design that has been engraved in, in our minds for so long? Um. The superiority, I'm sorry, would you repeat that please? Yes, so the question is, why is it hard for our people as a collective to let go of the superiority design that has been engraved in our minds? Okay, so if we're speaking um, through or about a racial lens, then we would, um, I would argue that it is um, a historical collective conditioning that we have experienced whereby the relationship of the owner and how that impacts um, our idea of power because we as a, collect as a collective have a traumatic experience whereby we were dehumanized, degraded, and disempowered on so many levels. And so no one wants to feel oppressed, no one wants to feel um, as if they have no power. And so unfortunately, sometimes we begin to adopt some of those values, but we often believe that if we just put black in front of it, or if it is a, a black space, that somehow that makes it better. And so we need to, especially at our institutions, 
where we are the majority, we need to be really mindful of some of this, um, you know, uh, colonized language that we use, um, such as, you know, uh, I run the yard and, and things of that nature. It's like, what are you truly saying in the context of ownership? Who, who are you running? Who, who do you own? Who, you, you see what I'm saying? And so we like to tell ourselves, oh, no, we just joking. But we need to actually come to a moment where we're actually really keeping it real and, um, and stop with the um, performative acts that we often um, will put on in front of the camera and look at the service that I'm doing, et cetera, et cetera. Look, we are already organized, especially, let's just keep it all the way real. At these HBCUs, you already have organizations. That's the number one thing that you need. And then from there, you get the mobilization of the masses and you impact and make and enforce the change that you actually want. But when it becomes, and I forget, I believe it was uh, Wilhelmina that was speaking, um, Philomena, I'm sorry, excuse me, um, that was speaking before, sometimes it, this, it becomes more about credit and look at me, here's my, here's my photo op of what I did. We don't have time for that. <laughs> at this moment if, if we haven't realized that by now. And so people who are already organized, this is the time to actually demonstrate why you're organized to begin with and actually do something that can be impactful for the community. Thank you, thank you. That, that was extremely important and point that you just brought up. Um, Moving forward, I would like to first extend my gratitude to all the speakers and the panelists and everyone who was a part of making this event happen and be as great as it is right now. Um, with everything that's going on in the world, I think it's important for us to, to go back to our roots. Um, personally, for me, I'm a Christian, so I believe that um, our religion has powered has been a battery for our movement since beginning of times, you know, from going back to singing Negro spirituals to going to churches with the masses. Um, so I would like to take us back to that point, if you all would bear with me. Um, I would like to usher us into a time of prayer um, in a way to join us as a collective and um, get us spiritually ready, prepared to fight this war because this, this battle is not ours. I mean, it is, it is. And we should always work towards it. But um, in order to win this battle, we need more than just us. We need to be spiritually connected. We need to be mentally connected. And that could be ranging from any religion, but just being spiritually connected. Um, so if you all would mind uh, bowing your heads in prayer with me. Dear Lord, I would like to come to you in the most humblest way and tell you thank you for everything that you have done for us as a people, dear God, from bringing us to a place where we didn't even realize how strong and powerful and magnificent and how beautiful our skin and our, our minds are, dear God, from not recognizing the things that we have set in place for this country and other countries to continue to succeed, dear God, to a point where now we realize our power, now we see our strength, and now we see our beauty, and now we know where we can take it, dear God. Dear Lord, we tell you thank you for everything you have done for us here, dear God. Dear Lord, we take, we want to tell you thank you. And we ask that you stay with us, dear God, and you continue to feel that fire that's burning under all of our toes, dear God, that are leading us to run towards freedom, dear God, because we know that we are not free, but we understand that without you, we will never be free, dear God. Dear Lord, we pray that you will come in and intervene with us, that everything that we say according to this initiative, according to this movement, according to this, this beautiful thing that you have set in our eyes, clear clear as day for us to see, dear God, will be of you, dear God, that will not come of hatred, but come of a place where we want to continue to power us, dear God, and not take any power from anyone, but continue to show that there is room on the mountains and the seats for us with you, dear God. Dear Lord, we tell you thank you, dear God. Dear God, we ask that you come in and, and, and stay with those who are oppressed, dear God, those who are going through these, dear God, who, those who are being brutalized and dehumanized and, and taken 
by a storm by the people who are leading us, dear God. We ask that you not only touch the oppressors, but the oppressed. Dear God, we ask that you sit with those leaders who are 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 making these laws, dear God, who are ushering us into these these worlds that we have no idea of. We ask that you go with the 3%, dear God, that you invoke a spirit of change, that you invoke a mindset of change, that not only that our works that we have and the faith that we have will come to pass, dear God, within us, but it will come to pass within those who do not see their wrongs, dear God, that you will open their eyes. Dear Lord, we pray for the children who are growing up in this world and seeing the things that we are seeing and who are being affected in ways that we cannot believe, dear God. We pray that you touch their minds, dear Lord, that you allow your your, your blood blood and your mercy to flow through their minds that they are not hurt, dear God, but in fact that they are inspired, dear Lord, and they recognize that faith without works is nothing, it is dead, that you continue to push them to move forward in their lives and their ambitions that they one day that they realize that they will rule this world and that we will be at a place of peace for all nations, not only America, but the entire world, dear God. Dear Lord, we ask that you continue to combat the things that we do not know, the spiritual things that are moving around us that we do not see dear God, that you continue to anoint every path that we move into, dear Lord, that you can continue to, to pour into us what we are lacking at, dear God, and you continue to build where we are lacking at, dear God. Dear Lord, we tell you thank you for everything you've had. We tell you thank you for everything you're doing, everything that we do not know that you're doing, everything that you're moving for us, that you continue to move it for us, dear God, and fuel us for it, dear Lord. We pray for the leaders, the leaders who are leading this movement, this initiative, this, 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 this powerful thing that we have in the palm of our hands. We pray for their mental health. We pray for their spiritual health. We pray for economic wealth upon our, our people, dear God. We pray that we'll be able to come together as one, as a collective, and move all the mountains that are in front of us, that we recognize our power, dear God, that we continue to see the things that we can do, and that we do not grow in hate, but we grow in passion and love for one another, because love is the, is the main thing that could lead us into beautiful things, dear God. Dear Lord, we tell you, thank you for everything that you're doing. We pray that, that we will see the change and we be the change, dear God, that we, we stop using these, these, these opportunities that you're placing in front of us as places and times for us to show off the things that we have and the power, because at the end of the day, what one has, if it's not equal to what the other has, it is nothing. It does not do anything for the cause. Dear God, we ask that you continue to just bless the people who are on this, on this call, dear God, and the ones who are thinking of it and the ones who aren't thinking of it, that you will bring upon a change. Dear God, a wise man once told me it takes 40 years to bring that change that we're all seeking. But dear Lord, I know that with you and with the people that you have already instructed, that if they just keenly listen to your instructions that we will be able to move forward that it won't take 40 days 40 years 40 hours but it'll take way less than that and we'll be able to concentrate our power concentrate our minds concentrate our our values concentrate our economic gains to pour into the ones that come in after us, dear God. Dear Lord, we know the things that we have seen were better than the things that our, our ancestors have seen, but we ask and we, we appreciate it, dear Lord, but we ask that you double that abundance onto our onto our youth, dear God. Double the abundance of, of, of intelligence and, and, and power and structure onto our children, that they'll be able to see the things that they're going through and not recognize it as, as, as trauma, dear God, but recognize it as fuel, as as a reason, as their why, to why they continue to move on this earth and realize that they have purpose. And the little things that they do make a purpose, make a, a, a big impact on the things that we have. Dear Lord, we tell you thank you for everything you've been doing for us. We tell you thank you for, for everything you've been doing for us in this COVID and keeping each one of us who are healthy, healthy and keeping with those who are sick, dear God. Dear God, you told us that you are our strength and whenever we need refuge, we should seek out to you. And right now I'm saying that our people need refuge. We need, we need peace, dear Lord. We need understanding that surpasses them all. We need to be able to come together as one and we know that with you, it is possible. Dear Lord, we do not only sit down and pray for, for us and the Black Lives Matter only, but we also pray for the people in Brazil, the people in Yemen, the people who are battling the immigration reform, the people who are in the Philippines fighting for their freedom of speech because we are also fighting for the same thing as them. Dear Lord, they say all lives matter, but how can all lives matter when our lives 
and the people in Yemen and the people who are in the Philippines, their lives and their voices do not matter. Dear God, we ask that you continue to pour your blood upon us, dear God, and cleanse us. And that you'll have an angel by each and every one of us, dear God. That you'll continue to send an angel before us and behind us and surrounding us. That we will continue to, to be protected by your blood and by you, dear God. We tell you thank you for all of the lives who were spared and sacrificed to continue to show and shine light onto this cause until until there's an unrest, dear God, we ask that you, you, you continue to bring that change of heart and mind into those who need it, dear God. We tell you thank you for, for sending your angels out here and sending your children and taking them in with you in your house above us all. We thank you for everything that you've been doing. We thank you for everything that you will do. And we continue to pray for collectively and, and family and every family and every everything that we're battling right now, dear God. And I will continue to remember that us as black and brown people, us as the minority, which is actually the majority, will continue to see our strength in numbers and see our strength and our powers that you have already placed in us, dear God. That everything that our people is battling with mentally, physically, emotionally, economically, dear God, that you'll continue to wipe it away, dear God. Dear Lord, we pray for this COVID-19 pandemic that's going on right now, that you will continue to touch and heal the, the lives of doctors, researchers, nurses, healthcare providers, and even those that we don't even think to praise for their continuous work that they're doing for us. We thank you for all the panelists that are here, all the viewers that are here, all the viewers that will watch this sometime later on, dear God. We ask that you continue to burn that strike of, of, of vigilance into us, that we continue to fight the war for people who cannot fight themselves. Dear Lord, thank you for everything you've been pouring into us and to me and to everyone who is around. We ask that you continue to pour into us that we'll be able to set an example for the future. Future and the future will be pure as you intended. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you for that. That was very powerful. I just want to thank everybody for coming. We have come to the end of our roundtable event. Um, we want to thank you for attending this event and the Alpha Zeta Chapter of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated and the Royal Court hopes that this event was informative, meaningful, and just helpful to you and meant something to you. We want to specifically thank Dashana Barber, Dr. Nashanti Battle, Dr. Bernadette J. Holmes, and Philomena Wakange for taking their time to pour into the community and join this important, and join this important discussion. You can keep up with us on all of our social media at, at Alpha Zeta SG Rose on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And this event deserves to be documented and will be uploaded on YouTube. So if you wanna go back and listen to some of our speakers points or you wanna share with a friend, it will be up as soon as possible. Thank you for coming. We had about up to like 50 participants. So this went very well. And I'm so thankful for everybody coming. And the Alpha Zeta chapter is just ecstatic. <laughs> so thank you so much. And that's it. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Pay attention to credible media. <laughs> Bye, everybody.